Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today on this Friday. Happy Friday. Um, we are waiting for one of our presenters who hopefully will uh, show up, but, um, but we, we thought we want to make sure we have time uh, to, to have Q&A and discussion. So we will go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining this presentation uh, sponsored by the uh, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Climate Change and Mental Health Task Force. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fire season and really all year is fire season uh, these days, sadly, uh, with, um, with everything that's going on. So we wanted to have this presentation to talk about a number of things um, the task force is doing uh, and ways we can help um, you and your patients and your families uh, uh, be prepared and, and cope with everything that's going on. So today we're gonna have, uh, besides myself, uh, uh, Tova Fuller, who will hopefully join soon, Alyssa Alpil and Robin Cooper, who are all wonderful faculty members in the department and are members of the uh, task force as well, leaders in the task force. So um, with that, let me turn it over to Alyssa to begin the presentation today, Alyssa. Welcome everyone. We are excited to spend this hour with you. I'm going to just show some slides to give us some context of the, the topic of heat. Okay, so <laughs> uh, not if you see my slide. Okay, so we are gathering today um, on a special week, the week that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has released their latest scientific report. This is a global community of 200 scientists, and they've been measuring climate change so carefully in different ways and giving recommendations. And at this point, they pretty much screamed out, this is a red alert for our planet. So it's an emotional time for those of us who really, um, like to see the metrics, the metrics have just simply increased and intensified to show human induced climate change is affecting climate extremes across the globe from moderate climates like ours to Siberia. It, it has caused extreme events, extreme heat waves, precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, and these are all increasing. So that's where we're starting from today. What else is happening today? Today, we have 200 fires burning in California. We have the largest one being the Dixie Fire. And we have many of us are, are feeling, seeing, and smelling, and breathing the smoke particles from these fires. So we here in California experience this directly and firsthand. And there are fires all over the globe today. Um, thanks to Robin, here are some recent headlines from the summer. The most anomalous heat we've ever experienced on Earth. In Portland, we know the temperatures have gone up to 116. Here's a cooling station in Portland. We know that there's fires across the Western United States. And then in Siberia, they have had the driest summer in 150 years. Here you can see in the middle, they have unprecedented heat wave and forest fires in Siberia that has engulfed their cities and communities in smoke. And so we see headlines like this, amid a summer of fire and floods, a moment of truth for climate action. What else is happening? We have, you can see here, Germany after flooding, you see landslides in India, and you see flooded subways in China. These are all related events. The the heat, the global warming comes first. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. This is a model of how the kind of causal model of how we personally, our, our health is being affected. So the gases are, ex are creating these extreme temperatures and we could call it global warming or global weirding where we're having dramatic shifts across the globe. This in turn creates these disasters wildfires, storms, droughts, harmful air quality. And all of these have direct impacts on our physical and mental health. Today, we're gonna to focus on mental health. There are two things that we can do. Primary prevention, be reducing greenhouse gases, being changing, changing our carbon burning um, 
lifestyle and energy dependence. And then we also have adaptation. So we all wanted to focus on prevention and mitigation. And the reality is that the climate crisis has landed very solidly and we are in crisis. And so we also need to focus on adaptation, which is mostly, well, our topic today is both. We're gonna be focusing on advocacy as well as adaptation. Now, there's a, another um, reality that we're facing, which is that in addition to climate affecting mental health, particularly people who are vulnerable, we are all experiencing the existential threat of climate change to our species, to all living species. So we will always have the yellow bubble, the daily drama, people facing their own personal stressors. And now we have this orange bubble, which are mega phenomena. These are feel out of our control. We have the pandemics and we have these climate disasters. And so what our task force is starting to do is tackle this in many ways, which uh, Adri will talk about. But one of the ways that affects us, affects the public health of all of us, particularly our youth, is that we cannot see these headlines without feeling some distress, loss, and grief. And the it will get worse. We will live for the rest of our lives with more frequent disasters. And it's possible our youth and our children will as well. And so the good news is that we what we do now, we are we have this amazing opportunity in front of us to be mitigating this, to be reducing the severity of the disasters. So part of the choice we face is to stay in the daily drama of the demands of our life and avoid, freeze, fear, deny what is happening or engage in it. And, and it, I think it's widely believed, and you as mental, many of you as mental health professionals understand that the only way to to deal with this type of distress and eco-anxiety is to engage in solving the problem. So we have this dialectic of tolerating despair as well as embracing the hope that we can make a difference, that we can still change things, that the future is in our hands. So how do we do that? Advocacy and climate action. And as health professionals, you have a a very unique role as a trusted voice and authority. And so there's a lot of climate health communities that you'll hear about. You can also attend our September 2nd webinar where we will directly be talking about what you can do in terms of advocacy. And there is our um, amazing Robin Cooper who we'll hear from. We'll hear from Ed Maybach who is an expert in how to talk about climate to reach that sweet spot of having people understand and be concerned, but not overly concerned and hopeless. So the social, the way we communicate is important. And we're excited to have Kimberly Williams who is training health professionals to be climate advocates. So this brings us to our topic today of mental health. Um, in addition to climate distress that we all have or will have or will continue to balance and struggle with, we have a really severe acute problem, which is that the heat creates mental health emergencies for people who are vulnerable. So a classic study in Toronto showed that during a series of four hot days, the admissions to ER rooms for psychiatric emergencies rose 30%. So each cumulative day of heat adds more risk. A new recent study on the state of New York showed the same thing, that extreme temperatures led to psychiatric emergencies. And this was across the, the uh, flavors of diagnosis. This was anxiety disorders, addiction, schizophrenia, dementia. Further, this actually was showing that what, what they called extreme is actually only 80 degrees. So Robin is gonna talk about what does it mean to live in a moderate climate and what temperatures do we need to worry about? So with that, I am going to turn this over to Robin Cooper.
Is this showing? Yes, we see your slides. Perfect. So, um, it was our intent to have um, uh, Tova Fuller here to speak before me to lay out a discussion of um, the mental health impacts of climate change. And she was actually going to walk through a day in the um, inpatient unit as an example of that. So my what I have been um, planning to speak about today is primarily who is affected and what we can actually do in response to that with just some ideas about that because what we can do is so enormous. But um, if, uh, if Tova doesn't show up, maybe I'll return and fill in a little about the, at least the range of things within the scope of mental health impacts of climate change, both direct affecting the specific impacts of heat, because that's what we're here to talk about today. And that would have to do with behavioral impacts, aggression and violence, cognitive impacts, the impact on our ability to think during extreme heat, sleep, the um, impairment in sleep uh, during extreme heat, and also some of the psychiatric medications that have significant impacts on our body's ability to sustain its core temperatures. But I'm going to go ahead with what I had planned to do, hoping that Tova will show up um, and give her day in the in the psychiatric unit. So what I said I was gonna to address today is who is at risk? And I'll say, we are all at risk, but we are not all equally at risk. And let's just take a minute to look at the, the part of us all at risk, particularly in our own community here in San Francisco, in our temperate climate. Now we live on the Pacific coast and the ocean is our um, natural air conditioner and it works to keep us in a very temperate climate. But for us, when heat reaches 85 degrees, we are what is considered in a heat wave and our bodies suffer at the temperatures at 85 and above. And of course, some of us lower than that depending our, on our health status. So a heat wave in San Francisco is 85 degrees. And we know that above that has happened uh, over many times. And it is the cumulative impact of heat over many days that also impairs our ability for our bodies to sustain our normal temperature. And we know that heat waves are getting more extreme and they're lasting longer and they're more frequent. You wouldn't know it today, like we need a, a down jacket to go outside, but that is the circumstances and we will be having more of those. Now, our bodies, our, our communities, our, our housing are not built around extreme heats. We live in this climate. I was born and raised here and never needed an air conditioner. Not true anymore. And I've gotten my husband to buy two air conditioners for the windows in my home. And I can do that at $250 a pop. I can afford that, but not everybody can. And that's an important thing to understand that our built environment is not built for extreme heat. The other is that in our temperate climate, we're, our bodies are not acclimated to, to heat. And what happens in a heat wave is there's immediate rapid increases over the baseline. It takes in the range of two to six weeks for our bodies to acclimate to higher, acclimate to higher temperatures. And we don't have that time in a heat wave. And that's important to know. And as you can see in this slide, the days when we've had extreme heat, there have been much more pressure on our emergency response systems. This is just a quick uh, um, uh, slide to show that over the last decade, there has not been, there's only been one year when we have not reached that 85 degrees, which is a heat wave in San Francisco. And 
The Chronicles uh, cartoon just this morning reminds us that it is not heat alone, it's humidity. And in a way we're lucky here because we don't live in a humid environment, but the combination of heat and humidity is what contributes to what's called a wet bulb index. And that means, that tells us that at levels, at what levels the body can tolerate and be, and be, be challenged in maintaining our core temperature because we, we are, our major mechanism for cooling is sweating and humidity interferes with that. And it's, uh, and the uh, 95 degrees of a wet bulb temperature is considered when we are stressed in maintaining that heat. I will suggest that there is the possibility in the future that we will become not only hotter, but more humid because hot air keeps more moisture. Now, but we are not all equally at risk to, uh, to dr dramatic disasters that are climate related or heat impacts. And the determinants of vulnerability are laid out here. Exposure, which is the likelihood to be exposed to a heat event, sensitivity, the, the sense, the degree to which any person or community will be impacted by that exposure and adaptive capability. That's the ability for individuals or, or communities to respond, to recover, to mobilize resources to get back, to improve and get back after a disaster. And those are primarily the social determinants of health. I want to let you know about the Department of Public Health, which has developed a heat vulnerability index. They looked at 21 variables and, and collected that data to develop ideas and drive and understanding about who is vulnerable to heat impacts. And then they laid that on top of the um, neighborhood um, census block uh, um, material, the mapping, which is in the far right corner, which shows the areas with the greatest heat exposure. And what they, what they found out is, is that their, their conclusion is that social and economic factors have the greatest contributions to vulnerability and an individual's ability to be exposed to, to prepare for and respond to heat events. They, they, uh, they determined that poverty and race were the largest contributors to the impacts of extreme heat in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. And I will say this is repeated over and over and over, all over the world. But this, and this is uh, of course of concern and an area for our intervention in our own community. The other factors that they list as major contributors are disability, isolation of older adults, language barriers, educational attainment, and park access. That means that covering of green space that we don't have very available in San Francisco. I want to bring your attention to the other populations at risk. Frail elderly, pregnant women, children, particularly young children, construction and outdoor workers, first responders, the poor, the homeless, the mentally ill homeless, and of course our young kids who are out there playing and, and young athletes. This is a reminder that, ooh, excuse me, that climate change is a multiplier of inequity. And heat is just one of the ways that climate change magnifies that inequities. And this cartoon shows those with wealth going up and the impoverished going down. Now, let's shift to what we can do. All efforts matter, but not all are equally impactful. 
and has, as Alyssa has also has already said, how we impact the political arena is important. She mentioned the blistering report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that just came out. They use words like unprecedented, unequivocal. They told us that, that we're baked in for temperature rises. Scientists don't use that language. They are banging the drum. This is an emergency. We must act. And again, the cartoon just this morning, it ain't just heat. It's all of these impacts that are related to global warming that are so essential to address. Now, I think of what we can do in terms of levels of intervention for healthcare providers at the individual patient level, at the systems of care, and at public health advocacy. And I'm gonna address some of it more extensively and others just gloss over. Well, they're all actually glossing over because you could, you could spend forever. But at the individual level, adding a prescription for heat health into patients' encounters is essential and before heat waves so that they're prepared. And I'm showing you this particular patient educational pamphlet that I developed in collaboration with Lisa Fortuna at um, San Francisco General. It was funded by the Earth Center here at UCSF. And it gives guidance either in a pamphlet or a poster form. And what is important about this is not only the information, which I think is essential, but what's important is it's translated into Spanish and Chinese. And that means, again, getting this material out that has, has language literacy who those do, for those groups who normally don't have that access. And anything that you can do to help get these into the clinics, we have them in printed form, they're downloadable, just contact me. Systems of care, that has to do with the broader relationships within our community. And the Department of Public Health is the leader here, but must do that in partnerships across all sectors in our community with community centers, community organizations, and building that resiliency at the level of community engagement. And I'm not gonna speak much about this. We can go back and talk more later if you'd like. Public health advocacy. This is where things are, where I think the biggest muscle has to be in responding because it addresses the underlying policies and funding apparatus around climate policies that have broad impacts. This, can ha this has to happen across all levels of governments from the local to the global, and you can't do it alone. It means you have to be involved with advocacy organizations that follow this and engage the populace in responding. Now, the IPCC report gave us an opportunity. They said that we can do better in the futures with deep reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse emissions, primarily methane, but not only. But it has to be drawn down quickly in the next decades. This is where we have to address the biggest efforts in uh, mitigation. And I'm going to address just what's on my bucket list today about what you can do around some of this political advocacy. And there are a number. But I'm telling you, this is my bucket list for this week. And the times are changing this week. It's been an enormous active week. The first, the Resilience Act of 2021. This is the only national legislation that I'm aware of that specifically is focused on mental health and developing community resilience. 
and it is specifically asked the CDC to establish offices that will prevent and heal psychosocial problems re resulting from what I basically think is climate change. You can call your congressman and ask them to introduce and enact this legislation. The Re reconciliation bill in the Senate this week. Whoa, what a lot of activity around this just this week. And it did the, the beginning work on this passed just the other night, I think at 4 a.m. on Wednesday morning. It's only a beginning structure of how to move forward on this. But this is where the national policies on climate will be developed along with really important efforts on healthcare and social policies. This is essential to pass, not only for the policies that will affect us domestically, but if this does not pass, we will be hamstringing President Biden when he goes to the international meetings in Glasgow in November. He cannot go there empty handed and expect the international community to make efforts to contain climate change. So call your senators, encourage them. This is going to be a complex political dance getting this through. Or join the National Day of Action next Tuesday with health professionals and the indigenous health leaders attempting to stop the pipeline line through that is planned to go through indigenous lands in Northern Minnesota. You can sign that letter to, pre to President Biden to stop that pipeline. If that pipeline goes through, there will be a contribution to emissions that are equal to 50 coal plants annually. And join us with PSR Bay Area to deliver that mess, that letter next Tuesday to um, the Army Corps of Engineers. Wear your healthcare garments uh, to show that you're a healthcare provider. And if you can't, you can join that after signing the letter um, on the social media platforms. And voting. Voting is an essential thing. And who we elect and who we keep in office makes a difference for climate policies and who votes matters. And we are in the middle of a recall election. You've probably got your ballots already or will in the mail soon. Vote by September 14th. So I thank you for that. The earth is in our hands. I look forward to talking about this. I'm not sure if Tova is here. And if not, I can address some of the content of the mental health impacts. And now to stop sharing this. Wonderful. Thanks, Robin. I don't think Tova has joined us. So I why don't I- I think we should go to Adri first and then Robin and then discussion. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. And then Robin, I'll turn it back to you. Um, uh, uh, after this, and we can we can do Q and A as well. So, let me um, do this quickly. Oops. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Great. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about today about kind of getting involved and taking action and what folks can do. Um, we're, the task force itself has been doing a lot of work. I'll talk about that in one sec, but the, the task force itself was formed two years ago to promote individual and collective action around cl the climate crisis and mental health consequences of that. And so um, we've, we've struggled admittedly a little bit during the pandemic. But, um, but you know, as everybody said, this is truly a crisis and, and we need to move forward. I just wanna just clarify just one thing. Um, we are an official department entity and a UCSF entity. So while we wanna make everybody aware of all the actions and legislation and letters and everything that's going on, 
we don't necessarily endorse anything, but but our goal is to make sure that um, you know what's going on, where you can take action and, and, and what you can do. So I just wanna make sure everybody's aware of that. So in terms of what we're doing, uh, so the task force itself is has developed materials and toolkits for clinicians in the community. Uh, Robin showed you one of those. There's a lot of other um, materials um, around coping and resiliency and and other and uh, both um, in terms of the clinical space, but also advocacy uh, that you can find on the website. And we'll we'll email out uh, things as well. Um, we've done local and national presentations and speaking engagements. Um, again, political and policy engagement um, where uh, we need to get involved and where we can get involved. Uh, education, mentoring, and curriculum development. Um, we've, we're working both in the residency and with trainees, both in the department and throughout UCSF. And then a lot of work on research surveys uh, and publications and papers, um, both, um, both internally working with external partners and, and doing work that hopefully informs our elected officials as Robin was talking about. Um, we, we, we have a lot of partners and resources that exist, but I wanted to just highlight a few. Um, we, we actually just had a meeting with the California Department of Health, Office of Health Equity. They have a climate change and health equity section. Um, we'll email this link out, but um, our leadership and the task force just had a call with, uh, with them. And I, the resources and tools they have on their website are incredible. Um, and, and you can really get local and specific um, to kind of see what's going on in your local community and your neighborhood. So I would, I would strongly urge people uh, to check out the resources they have there. Um, Climate Health Now is a, uh, is a, I believe, a Northern California organization that's mobilizing uh, 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 health professionals to get involved. They are doing some incredible work. The Climate Psychiatry Alliance that Robin helps lead, um, as we mentioned, it has some incredible resources and is doing incredible work. Um, the, this is relatively new, the UCSF Center for Climate and Health Equity, um, it, uh, our task force is part of this and working with them, but they are, I think they were formed just a few months ago and is really um, making an effort to centralize all the work that's going on uh, within UCSF and really the entire UC system around climate change and the climate crisis. And then the UCS Office of Sustainability is doing some incredible in terms of what we can do uh, throughout UCSF to, to, to um, help uh, within the, within the uh, university itself. Um, so a couple initiatives and actions that are ongoing. Um, one is, and folks may not know this, but there are no ICD codes related to climate distress. Um, this, uh, this is an area that's gaining traction. Um, and if we can get coding that will identify when there is climate distress, it'll help with data tracking, quality of care, health outcomes, various other things. And that's an effort um, that is ongoing, uh, but, but needs help. Um, so I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's the Preventing Health Emergencies and Temperature-Related Heat and Illness Deaths Act that has been introduced by Senators Markey and our own Senator uh, Padilla here in California. Um, you can kind of read a little bit about this. I won't go into details, but, uh, but it would make a big difference if we can get this passed. And then um, there's an effort actually that we just found out about and we're gonna be working on through the task force with the California Department of Public Health around the cost burden of mental health impact and climate change related to work productivity, healthcare costs and various other things. This, this is kind of an area that has not had a lot of work um, put into it, but, but it's tremendous. And we're gonna be trying to help uh, gather data and help them with that effort. Um, Robin mentioned the Resilience for All Act um, and what that would do, so I won't talk about that. And then just, uh, uh, just a couple days ago, um, we got a, a notice from the National Institute of Mental Health around a request for information um, around what the NIH is doing to enhance uh, research on health implications. Climate change, that's part of the NIH uh, Climate Change and Health uh, Working Group. Um, so we'll send out that information as well. And then I just wanna end with um, how you can help. So the task force itself, we are always in need of more people um, with everything going on and the new number of projects I mentioned. Um, we can help in a couple different ways. If you wanna advocate, if you wanna do more um, externally or internally um, within UCSF or the UC system, um, we can help connect you um, 
with those organizations, individuals, campaigns that are going on, um, advocacy initiatives. Um, if you're interested in climate care, or, sorry, clinical care education research, or um, you know, education uh, for trainees or students, um, we're doing a lot of work in that area, so we can help you get connected. Um, and then, just lastly, our uh, website for which has a lot more information on it. And then, if you want to get involved, um, please feel free to reach out to myself or Sam Abona, um, and uh, and we will get you connected with the right folks. So um, now I will stop sharing and uh, turn it. I I don't think Tova has joined. So. Um, Robin, if you um, want to maybe talk for about five more minutes, then maybe we can open it up to questions. And if folks have questions or comments uh, they'd like addressed or anything they want to mention, please um, put it in chat. But we'll also open up the line so people can can talk directly. So, Robin, um, I I'm not sure um, whether we want to spend time talking with each other more fully. Um, or hearing from me, I, I it starts to be like just dumping uh, information <laughs> at all of you. One of the things I want to say is there's so many people on this call, on this, uh, at this session that names I don't know. And I'm like delighted that we're not just preaching to the already converted or maybe converted, but um, those who are already active. So I'm just welcoming everybody here. I just want to review again, those broad topics of, uh, of heat impacts on mental health, particularly. We clearly know that met, that um, extreme heat is in, it has a huge morbidity and that there are, that these are hugely impacting um, general health in, um, and mortality and morbidity, but very specifically in the realm of mental health. And I'm just going to uh, go through the broad categories of that very quickly. Extreme heat has very specific impacts on behavior, thinking, sleep. Behaviorally, extreme heat causes an increase, we all know this, of uh, irritability. We're all cranky when it's hot out there. I'm hot under the collar, our language tells us. But it is also true that not only are we cranky, um, we, also have, we also know that there are increases in aggression and that there are, and this has huge implications for um, domestic violence, for abuse of children, interpersonal violence increases, but also intergroup violence. And, um, and those are also very significant. Additionally, there is aggression turned inward. We know that there are very that there are increases in suicide due to heat alone. Even though we know it's a uh, suicide and aggression have multi components, but heat alone increases suicide at a particularly significant level. In addition to um, the impacts of, of behavior in those realms, we don't think well when it's really hot out there. There's impairments in working memory and in executive function that has implications for learning, for performance on the job, for doing significant cognitive tasks. And that has important implications for our patients who are marginally compensated. And you add heat onto that and that can cause um, extreme difficulty for our compromised patients insomnia. When, I don't know about you, but I can't sleep at night. And that's why I want one of those air conditioners in my bedroom. But insomnia has, um, has impacts on all levels of functioning and is also very significant for the mentally ill. It can, um, sleep impairments can have an impact on mood disorders and on um, bipolar. So I think insomnia, even though it's sounds like not a big deal. I didn't get a good night's sleep. I think it actually is. 
And then for us in the mental health field that prescribe psychiatric medications, those medications can have significant, can have impacts on our body's ability to sustain our core temperature. And we need to learn more about how to manage the medications that we use and inform our patients ahead of the time about how to use those safely. And I'm actually just delighted that I, um, I'm working with a pharmacologist here at UCSF and hope that we can get a more granular look at some clinical guidelines. But I'm gonna like close my mouth at this point and see if we can chat with each other. Yeah, let me um, let me do this. Let me address two things that came up in chat, and then maybe we can open it up for folks. Um, so um, one was um, particular to the uh, to the um, the recall. I think I assume the recall election. Um, so we can we can perhaps send out some information, nonpartisan information um, around the election, and some resources that folks can access. Um, but we're going to be admittedly a little bit limited in, in what we can send you, but we will, we will share that um, with this group and feel free to um, forward that out. And then I think the second question is around how can, how can we suggest to people they, they, how, how can we help people better kind of uh, address the mental health impacts and how they can talk about mental health and related to climate change, because it's not, it's not something people think about readily. So what are kind of ways we can, uh, besides toolkits, but uh, I guess Alyssa and Robin, any suggestions on how people can talk about that more in their kind of daily Let, Let's health? hear from Karen what um, oh, sure. specifically yeah. Yeah. Is, is part of the question about dealing the advocate's own climate distress as a obstacle or... Thank you. I'll give a couple more sentences for that. Um, for the whole group, my name is Karen Lewis, and I work with the National Jewish Environmental Organization called Hazon. And we have a bunch of programs that are designed to help our Jewish organizations and actually individuals as well be better environmental stewards. And both for us as a team, as well as for our green teams at all these different organizations, they're all dealing with the same stress as you've all been talking about right now, as far as hearing all the news about fires and dealing with the health issues and, and disparities among communities. Somehow you need to compartmentalize that or do something with that so you can continue to move on with that work and do this important work. We want to give all of our organizations those tools and our employees as well so we can do that effectively and still continue to move forward. And so we're looking for guidance on that. We're actually looking for a speaker for an upcoming symposium we're happy and who can also speak to that as well. So I'm just wondering what you can share with us with respect to resources. Good question. I'll let Robin start. Go into Alyssa, you can start because I'm trying to get my head around. I'm not yes. actually, I'm actually. I, I appreciate the question. One thing I have learned is that people who are on the front lines of this have number one, developed amazing coping resources for being able to continue this work like a robust hope and a social support network. Secondly, they still suffer. The, the amount of burnout and deep distress in, in climate activists and you know all of us whose eyes are open and are engaged in this is still immense. And I, I would like to say that this is a big gap and a need that you've identified, that this is a new um, kind of public mental health need, that, that we need a new robust mindset. We are not mentally prepared for these headlines day after day and for the direct contact and exposure to these disasters. So I personally am trying to develop a program with colleagues, Robin Cooper, Adrian Van Husen, Ed Maybach, who is specialized in communications that focuses on distress to activation. And, and that's kind of a, a buzzword out there because we all know we don't, we don't want to get rid of our climate distress. First of all, we can't, it, means we, it would mean we don't care, and it's unnatural. And secondly, the only way to manage it is to actually be doing something about it, is to be having adding that in some way. And so there's a lot of questions. How can you, everyone here listening is obviously asking themselves, what should I do? What can I do? 
and we all have day jobs and only 2% of the world is, in, is paid full time to do environmental work. So thank you, Karen. You are one of the lucky ones, um, but of course there's a price. So I think the, there, the psychological um, regulation of tolerating distress and grief is an ongoing process. It needs people, support and discussion and we don't talk about this because it's so threatening. And we need to talk about climate at dinner. We need to be normalizing the distress we feel and be having avenues for all of us to contribute in the way we can. So I don't have an easy answer for you. I think that uh, there's, there's therapists. We don't, that's not a solution. There's support groups that for activists that might be helpful. And there's what we're trying to push out and develop very quickly. That's kind of more of a model for groups, organizations like yours. It's just not in hand, but I'd be happy to give a talk. Robin would, other people on our task force would. So let's talk further, Robin. So I just want to reiterate a few things that you said and underscore first off that this facing the reality of what, what is happening in our world is distressing. It should be distressing. It should be uncomfortable. It should make us anxious. And the first thing I think is important to know is this to normalize that. Our biology is set is, is, is organized to be alerted when there is real threat. And this is a real threat. What's different about our alerting system is this is an ongoing threat, not, uh, not just something that is an emergent alert, uh, an, an acute um, thing, but it, it is normal to have these feelings. The task is to tolerate discomfort. The task is to tolerate the, un, un, the discomforting feelings that go with this awareness. And Joanna Macy actually speaks about this in, a reflective Buddhist thinker that that actually that distress actually reflects your caring, your loving about the world that we're in. But I think as Alyssa has also said, translating that into activity that engages you in a sustaining way to tolerate the long process of doing this is really important in whatever ways people can participate. And I think, and I think Alyssa agrees with this, that that can't happen individually. It happens in the context of collaborative work that is sustaining because you're connected with others doing it for the emotional support. But for me, it's like, I always have a to-do list. I mean, it's never goes down, but my to-do list also means I have a responsibility to those I work with to do this in an everyday way. Um, now I'm lucky, I'm semi-retired, I have a lot of time. And those of you who are still more involved in other periods of your life and other activities can also engage in other ways that are also sustaining. And um, Karen, contact me and let's talk more about what your organizational collaborations hey. might be with us. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Alyssa. I appreciate that. I would just also add, you know, we use the terminology turning anxiety into action a lot. And we, we know firsthand, because I've talked to people and others, and I think there's even been studies on this, that taking that anxiety around the climate crisis and turning it into action around addressing the climate crisis actually helps um, with mental health and um, and helping people feel better. So, um, I mean, it's there's there's little causation there. So, does anybody else want to jump in or say anything? For questions. Uh, hello. Um, hi, my name is Rishabh Chawla. Um, I'm actually just a medical student. Um, but thank you uh, so much, Dr. Uh, Appel, Dr. Cooper, for your you know very powerful presentations and comments uh, just now too. Um, so this, you know, intersection of climate change and mental health has been an interest of mine for some time, and I'm currently uh, working on a resolution in the AMA Med Student section, you know, calling on them to uh, acknowledge and address climate change specifically as a mental health threat. Um, 
And so my question is like, uh, what should we be like demanding from, you know, groups, organized medicine and um, other bodies on, on this front? Is it things like developing like toolkits for clinicians, like was mentioned earlier, or is it increasing like mental health resources for uh, survivors of you know, uh, natural disasters, extreme weather events? So I'm just curious on like what would be like a good ask uh, for a project like that. Thanks. Uh First off, I just want to comment, you are not just a medical student. You are our future hope and leaders. And I can't applaud you more for already getting involved with the AMA medical students group. I also want to say um, that, that there are, as I said earlier, there's action across many levels and there is action that has more robust impacts and some that are less. I would say that what's important to do is finding the area that you have leverage in. And you've already started on that path as a medical student working with other medical students within the AMA. It would be likely my suggestion, although many things, that as a medical student, you can join with other medical students advocating for curriculum and education across all sectors of healthcare education, because that's your special voice and you can have impacts in your institutions and we must develop a literate healthcare professional community that are literate in climate change science and interventions and clinical activity. That would be, I think the, the principle of that is do something where you have most leverage. And just as a response to the whole group, uh, Audrey said, turn anxiety into action. Action is many different ways and it should fit your style, your personality, your temperament. And I also think it should fit where you think you can have some leverage. So an example, a quick example of, you know, our curriculum, Robin went around to each person in psychiatry giving a lecture to the medical students and said, you know, can add what's relevant about climate here, here and here. And then she knocked on the doors and one of the lectures was me and I had nothing on climate. And she said, Alyssa, it's you, you know what to say. Why aren't you inserting, you know, about climate distress in this wellness lecture? And it's that kind of, and I was like, oh, why do I have a silo around what I do? I do this, this, and this, and then climate's over here. We should be talking about it wherever we can in our domains. It is not, a, it's not political activism. It's about life and death of our planet, of the species, of all of us. And so I think once we realize we should, you know, it's an invitation and it's an important one that you should feel encouraged to add it where you can to be talking about it. And so, you know, like Robin said, asking yourself, what is it that, what are the open doors around me in my domain, in my workplace, my home, my neighborhood, my community, et cetera. So I think the medical students are an extremely powerful node. So it's very exciting, Rashid. Thank you so much. I'll definitely be leveraging the avenues I have. So appreciate that. And, and feel free to be in touch with us, you know, if you if you want to run anything by us. I mean, we have a lot of people in the task force who've been working on this a long time. So we're happy to help. And, I, and I'm sure that you already know that there's a medical student group on campus, that the medical students are working in collaboration with the Stanford medical students. Um, so join with your your buddies. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify. I'm actually I don't go to UCSF. Um, okay. I just found this uh, oh, yeah. link through my googling um, and okay. stumbled upon it. So uh, I'm actually in Georgia. So, but oh, cool. um, thank you. <laughs> well, there's a, a new fellowship program for physicians, particularly physicians of color in Georgia. We're um, the leader of that's going to speak at our webinar on the um, early September. I hope you can come and meet her. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. It's almost one o'clock. So I just want to just wrap up, uh, thank Alyssa and Robin again for um, being here and everybody for joining. Nicholas, thank you for your help uh, with logistics. And again, uh, please feel free to reach out to us um, if you have questions, you need help, or if you want to get involved, uh, most importantly, uh, please wanna, let us know. I yes, wanna, Robin. 
I just really want to thank Nicholas and let everybody know there were a zillion links in just what I said and what Adri said. And I think Nicholas is going to pull those together and make those av available for everybody. Yeah, yeah that's and that's right. We'll uh, we'll send out a copy of the, the recording of this and all the links to you via email. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. My last word is find a resilience pod, find people who will support you and you'll support them in this work. It's too hard to go at it alone. Thank you.